for the talk this morning, right? <laughs> Between the meditation, the kids. Uh, I'm Cindy Grimes, I'm Reverend Cindy Grimes, for those of you who are first time visitors. <laughs> so happy to be here this morning. I was gone last week, and so it feels like forever when I'm not here. But to come in this morning and the kids are back in my office, and the floor is scattered with toys. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful thing, I love it, you know, to feel that energy and excitement and the vitality of our kids. It's just wonderful to have them here. It's so great to have you all here. So uh, our title this morning is Beyond Surviving to Thriving. You'll notice in your program we flipped it, that was an error. <laughs> from, from thriving to surviving, we don't wanna do that, right? We wanna go the other way, from surviving to thriving. But one of the first things I wanna do this morning is thank Kelly Brigman oh, for speaking yes. on stage. Yes. And, uh, and for the challenge, I did indeed watch, I did indeed listen, and I, I, I was very moved. And I feel like today's talk is going to be a good spin off of what Kelly spoke about last week. Um, so I wasn't here last week, and uh, I had planned to be. Kelly was planned to speak, but I was going to be in the audience. And unfortunately, I was not able to be here because my, my Aunt Sylvia is in the process of making her transition. She's my dad's twin sister. You'll see that picture there. So you've seen my dad. That's I don't even know how old that picture is. But that's dad, and that's... And that's Sylvia, and um, so she's had uh, a battle with cancer for some years now, and, um, and I think is ready to, to end that battle. So we're still a little up in the air about it, and miracles happen, and so uh, we're just open to all of it, but for right now the family is rallying and just kind of taking care of her. And uh, so, yeah. I think it probably irritates the staff here a little bit, our staff of volunteers, that um, you know a lot of people plan things out for months and years. Like some people can say, this is what I'm gonna talk about and these are our topics. And for me, it changes week to week. <laughs> Sometimes I think I know what I'm gonna talk about and then life just happens and I incorporate that and it seems I can't speak, of, there's nothing else to talk about because that's what's up for me. So this is part of what is up for me. Uh, in this idea of making the transition and, and life and death and dying and what does it all mean? Uh, because after coming home from this on Sunday evening, I found out on Monday that our dear Reverend Gail had made her transition. Now some of you know Gail, some of you took classes with Reverend Gail, and uh, Reverend Gail came to us uh, around 2015, maybe the end of 2014, as I was stepping into the pulpit, Reverend Peggy, who was the minister here for 20 years, was, was <coughs> leaving and making space for me, and Reverend Gail happened to come at the same time, and it was such a wonderful gift for me uh, to see my mentor walking out the door, and here's this church, you know, a brand new gig for me, and uh, it was wonderful to have Reverend Gail to be that support person, and she was like my security blanket. I mean, she just was a wonderful help who shared her wisdom and her knowledge and her love of this teaching and her love of prayer. She served on the, uh, on the Ministry of Prayer on a national level for the organization, and she was just a great champion of this teaching, <coughs> of this center, and a great cheerleader for me. And so she will be greatly, greatly missed. So that's, you know, that's what's, what's up for me, is this idea of, of the passage and, and this thing that happens for all of us, right, for all of us. It is, a lot of people, a lot of people kind of shy away from talking about death and dying, feeling like it's morbid or it would be too depressing or, you know, there was a time when this congregation, I would say the average age was probably 70. <laughs> and it was never spoken of. It was like a taboo thing we didn't talk about, but um, I come from a different perspective. And um, um, one of the many things I've done in my career was to have been a hospice social worker, so I bring that background with me and that understanding. And what I believe is an important thing to talk about, and that this idea of the transition, the end of life, is something that we absolutely all, every single one of us, will face. And so to get comfortable with that idea, right, to realize that our time here in physical form is limited, I think is important. 
I think it's really important. And I think when we keep that in the forefront, like, look, I'm here for a time. I'm here with a job to do, and I'm going to do it and not let myself get pulled off here and there and everywhere with all these other distractions that happen that take us off and keep us in this terrified kind of survival mode. You all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. How many people are hung up feeling like, I've just got to make it, you know, is there going to be food on the table? Am I going to have a job? Do I have health care? Like all of these things that, that get in the way of us living our lives and what we're really here to do, mm -hmm. right? It becomes a great distraction. So here's what I'm telling you. Nobody's surviving. None of us. Nobody gets out of this life alive, not a single one. So now, just put that to the side, right? Because we all have these, I think there are deaths that happen, little deaths as we go along life, little things that we let go of, things that you can't do anymore, things that change, relationships that disappear, jobs that go away. We have these little deaths that happen throughout life until we get to the big one. And so, well, we have some kids in here, but I'm going to share it anyway. A, a little interesting fact, a little something that I found out recently, was um, the French have a phrase, <laughs> have a phrase for um, the ultimate climax, let's put it that way. Right, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, code language for the little ones. <laughs> the, the orgasm, we'll call it that. And what they call it, what they call it is the petite mort. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Anybody speak French? Yeah. The small death, the small death. And it's not such a bad thing, is it? <laughs> so imagine what if the end of life, the big death, is the big death, right? It's that coming of oneness and communion with all that is, releasing the ego, releasing the, the, all the drama, the trauma, all of that stuff, and to having that, that moment of unity and complete oneness and releasing everything else. And just what a beautiful thing that is. So I'll just leave you with that idea, you know? that all of this fear and all of this trepidation that we have around this thing that happens for all of us, right? What if it's just a great big O? <laughs> right? That wouldn't be so scary. In fact, that would be a pretty wonderful thing. A pretty wonderful thing. And I think that's, I think that's what we have to look forward to. You know, the caterpillar, when it's crawling around in its caterpillar world, probably has no, has no idea, has no idea that it's going to soar, that it's going to fly, but yet that's what's up for the caterpillar, right? And that is what's up for each one of us. There is a time that we are here, and we're crawling along like those caterpillars, and then there is a time for us to make that transition and go into the next world, whatever that is. So I invite you to just consider that possibility. Ernest Holmes says this, we should live as though we are in eternity now, while at the same time realizing that the seams of eternity are forever shifting. We shall never be caught in any one seam, for if we were, our evolution would necessarily cease. We are continually, continually evolving. We know that the one thing that is constant in our world is change. Right? It is always, always changing. Life is continually changing, evolving, bringing us to the next level of understanding and awareness and expression. And that's part of what I love about being in this place, because we are consciously aware of that. Or trying to be, right? We come back here so we can plug in and remember that when we get pulled off in life and all of those distractions happen and you start getting in that fear survival mode, you know, that you can come back here and remember, you're not here to survive. You're not here to survive because that's not gonna happen. We are each here to thrive, right? Thrive, don't just survive. I love that image, I love that picture. Just, we're here to make the most of the life that we've been given. And people leave, people make their transitions. They go on ahead of us, right? But those things are, are moments, if for me, for me to remember the truth of why I'm here and the truth of why we're all here. So how do we move from that survival mode into this thriving mode? The idea that your life is your masterpiece. 
Whether you think of it, if, if you're an artist and you think of that blank canvas, know that spirit, that life has given you the canvas, has given you the paint, the paintbrushes. It's up to you what you want to put on that canvas. If you're a writer, you have the blank page. Life has given you the page. Life has given you the words, the experiences, the things to write with. It's up to you to decide what you want to put on that page. Another analogy is the actor on stage. Right? The actor comes in or, or in a production where there's a scene. It's all set for you, right? The time is set, the different characters that are part of it. You get a, a persona that you're going to be, and you get a costume that you wear for a while, and you go on stage and you inhabit. You, you, you make it yours. You make it yours. And that's what we're here to do in life. Absolutely everything and anything you could possibly need to give your gift in this life already exists. It is already there. You have all the raw material. My, my work is this, right, is, is what I do. So in my creative space, I, I look at what are the experiences that have happened to me this week? What are the, the, uh, the, the messages? What is spirit trying to, to, to tell, first of all? That's the first thing that I do. If you want to thrive, cultivate your curiosity. Cultivate, you know those guys? Yeah. Oh, they're so cute, aren't they? Those are my grandsons. <laughs> and uh, I chose an image with children because children are always curious. Right? They're always asking the question. At some point, we stop doing that. You know, too many of us start to think, well, I already know it. You know, I don't need to ask questions. I got this. I got this. No, stay open. Always be open. Like a child is open, cultivating that curiosity and that wonder and that question. So before I sit down and I write a talk, I vision. I do a process called visioning. And for those of you who may not be familiar with that, it's just you go into a meditative state. And this is something that um, Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith has, has written books about, and we do it as a movement. And visioning is a way of, of capturing what is it that spirit has in mind? What is the biggest? What's the, what is this all about? So you ask that. What is spirit's highest vision? I ask, what is spirit's highest vision for this talk? What is the message that I'm here to give on Sunday? What is it that people need to hear? What is it that I need to speak? What is the biggest possibility? And so we stay in that. And then there were other questions, but we'll talk about that another time. But cultivate your curiosity. Ask the question when you get up in the morning, what am I to do today? Right? Spirit, show me. Spirit, guide me. Lead me. Right? To my best and highest good. Use me, as the song says. Use me. Cultivate your curiosity. Courage and compassion, courage and conviction, excuse me, compassion is coming later. And these are in no specific order, okay? I just, uh, I've, I've got all these words together and they all start with C so that you would remember them. <laughs> so we've got creativity and, uh, and questions and so now courage and conviction. And I think those two things go together. I'm not sure which one goes first. I don't know that there is a first, right? When we come into this world, we're we, we, we were first in, in the womb of, of the mother, and we don't have a need or a care in the world, right? Everything is taken care of. And then we come out, and then we have to, sometimes there's a little struggle where things don't come as quickly as you think they might. So I'm not sure if the conviction comes first or if the courage comes or first. You know, is it the conviction, the knowing that I'm always okay? No matter what happens in life, no matter what it looks like, what's coming at me, I'm always okay. You know, that's the faith. That's the conviction. And maybe that's where it starts. Because once you know that, then you're not as afraid to take that step. Right? You're not as afraid. Then it's easier to have the courage because you know, I'm okay. And I'm not getting out of here alive anyway, so I might as well go for it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Might as well, might as well. Have a good time. Do it all. I mean, what are you waiting for? This is your life. If that, that's your wake up call today. If anybody's waiting, do I do it? Don't I do it? Which way do I go? This is your life. <laughs> do it now. That's your answer. 
So courage and conviction. If you want to thrive in life, you've got to have that, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I'm here for? You know, and, and the curiosity will help you find that. And then the courage to take the step into it. This is a big one, being conscious, being, being aware. Just being aware in your life. When we get in survival mode, we all know what survival mode feels like, right? It's a scary place. And things can become, it's like when we get in fear, you know, you've got all, first you've got all these possibilities. And then when you're in fear, it's like all of that shrinks down. We become very tunnel vision. And all you see is the thing, that scary thing in front of you. You miss all of the other possibilities that are around you. So by being conscious, I mean being aware of the messages that life is giving you, right? The messages that are bubbling up for you. I found this, um, this book was referred to me this week. I said that statement about change, that everything in life is changing or continually changing. And one of my coworkers at River Phoenix said, you've got to read this book. And so I've got all these notes in here and I've just gotten through the introduction. Um, so I want to read what the author, and by the way, the book is called Emergent Strategy. And what the author says here about becoming conscious. She says, I'm listening now with all of my senses as if the whole universe might exist just to teach me more about love. I listen to strangers. I listen to random invitations. I listen to criticism. I listen to my body. I listen to my creativity and to the artists who inspire me. I listen to elders. I listen to my dreams and the books that I'm reading. And I notice the more I pay attention, the more I see order, the more clear the messages, the more patterns I see, and invitations in the small or seemingly random things that happen in my life. In all these ways, I meditate on love. And so she goes on to, to talk about um, some other ways. Well, let, let me give you a little bit on the back here what this book is about. Change is constant. Change is constant. The world is in a continual state of flux. It is in the stream of ever mutating emergent patterns. But rather than steal us, steal ourselves against such change, this book invites us to feel, to map, assess, and learn from the swirling patterns around us in order to better understand and influence them as they happen. This is resolutely materialist spirituality based equally on science and science fiction. Materialist spirituality, which is like right up our alley, right? We, we believe in God, we believe uh, in the Christ nature, we believe in oneness, uh, but we don't believe in the same as some other denominations do. So materialist spirituality, that kind of works for me. <laughs> so, in being conscious, one of the things that is very helpful for me and also for the author of this book is the study of nature. And nature, oh, like, God shows up in nature. You know, that's, that's where God is, right? And the things that spirit created, that God created, not us. I mean, God is in the chair as well, right? God's in the room, the things that man created. But there's something about being in nature and getting close to the source. And so in this book, they talk about the patterns of things, you know, and that we are here as part of that pattern. But sometimes it's like, you know, the phrase, uh, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees, right? That you're, you're in it so much that you can't see the larger picture and the bigger pattern of it. So this is what she talks about. And so I want to show you some of these patterns that you may or may not have noticed that you see in nature. You know, that to me shows patterns. It's like the fingerprint of God, right? Where we see these emerging patterns and things. And so you've got a river system, and you've got the trees, branches, and lightning, and, and an x-ray of a lung where you see the blood vessels. And it's all very similar looking, isn't it? Almost as if it was planned. <laughs> 
Then we have like the Fibonacci sequences with the swirls. Are you all familiar with that sacred geometry? You know, where these, these swirls and these numbers show up in so many different ways in a pattern, almost like it was planned. <laughs> right, we've got the fern. And there are also some, they're fractals. Anybody familiar with that term about fractals? You know, it has something to do with, uh, you know, the, the small pieces. Within the, pattern. the pattern is within the pattern, thank you. Like the, the fern there, it has a little pattern in its leaf, and that pattern is recreated larger and larger and larger. But as you break it, it the, like the microcosm and the macrocosm, right? See, you've got the radials and the flower there, and there's another, can you see the swirl? In the middle of the sunflower, isn't that cool? When you start looking at life and start noticing the patterns, you know, you really do get that feeling of being part of something much, much larger. And I wonder where my piece is in this little, in these patterns that are emerging. Here's another set. Now we've got the birds flying in formation. Who tells them to do that? How do they know to do that? Right? They have a teeny, teeny, tiny brains. We have this great big brain and all this ability and, you know, we, sometimes we don't have the sense of a flock of birds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, the leader is not always in the front. They take turns. Right? They help one another. They lift one another. And then you've got these other birds that are just amazing. What are they? Starlings? They're yes. called, you know, how they move in these swarms and they just amazing stuff. I really would like to show you a video of that if you've not seen that before. It's really quite amazing. Uh, and then we've got insects, you know, that just, they have their own patterns and their understanding and their way of communicating. And we've got some ants in our kitchen right now. <laughs> we cannot get rid of these things. <laughs> they seem to find ways around everything that we put out there. You know, they, there is awareness, there is an understanding, there is a life force there. And of course the honeybees, and then schools of fish, right? These patterns of things that creatures do, that's just part of their, maybe it's part of their DNA. I don't know, I don't know, I just know it's there. So I wanna read what she says about these, these patterns that we see. <laughs> And how you can get messages. Now, one of the things when I go out in nature is if an unusual thing crosses my path, I'm right away looking at the book. What is the, sim the symbolism of this thing? What is this message that it's trying to give me? So messages come in so many ways. So she says about ants, um, this is, yeah, anyway, part of the emergent strategy here. Ant societies function through individual ants acting collectively and in accord with simple local information to carry on all their survival activities. They represent cooperative work and collective sustainability. Isn't that interesting? So now with the ants in my kitchen, I'm thinking I probably need to embrace teamwork a little more. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> what she says, ferns. Ferns are a form of fractal. Fractal is an object or quantity that displays itself similar, similarly, which means that it looks roughly the same at any scale. Thank you, Tab. Small scale solutions impact the whole system. Use similar principles at all scales. So it's like make things right on the small scale. The small things are representative of the big scale, right? We, we, we tend to ourselves spiritually, and as we do that, other things change. Isn't it interesting how that happens? We're all the microcosm within the macrocosm. Small changes can make big changes, mm -hmm. right? When accumulated. Mm -hmm. The starlings. She says the synchronized movement patterns of starling flocks are known as a murmuration. Guided by simple rules, starling murmurations can react to their environment as a group without essential leader orchestrating their choices. In any instant, any part of the flock can transform the movement of the whole flock. It's about collective leadership, partnership, and adaptability. Yeah. How about that, huh? And then we have the dandelion. That's another <coughs> emergent species. The dandelion flower head can change into a white globular seed head overnight. The entire plant has medicinal properties. 
but they are often mistaken as weeds and aggressively removed. However, they are hard to uproot. Anyone ever had dandelions in their lawn knows that, right? The top can be pulled, but the long taproot often remains. The dandelion is symbolic of resilience, resistance, regeneration, and decentralization. Isn't that interesting? All the messages that we can get from nature and the realization that we are part of that. We are part of that of those systems and the order that is trying to emerge from us right now is something that, that we really are in need of as a species, I believe. And some new answers. And we can get them from observing nature and being more conscious and aware in our own lives. The last thing, if you want to strive, is the idea of having care and living with care and compassion, having care and compassion. In other words, love, love. That's what it comes down to. If you want to thrive in your life, it's about love. It's all about love. And, and I truly enjoyed the, um, Kelly's talk last week and how he brought up M. Scott Peck. And the exact quote, Kelly, would you say it again? Do you remember it? <laughs> love is... Love is the willingness to extend ourselves for the well-being of another. Yes, love is the willingness to extend ourselves for the well-being of another. Of another. That is what we're here to do. <coughs> Not to survive. I mean, and you know, think about it. What would be the fun of surviving <coughs> if everyone else in your world was gone? Right? It really is about the love that we share, and that's why we're here. Why we're here. The author of this book says something else really cool in here about that. Let me see. I had so many notes. So many notes. No, actually, it's not her. It's somebody else. You know, what I'm saying here, for some people, seems like the opposite of what science would say, and she speaks to that. Lots of people. It, it's, again, science is evolving. We are evolving as a species. So we've come up with a, those of us who, um, who have an appreciation, understanding of science, may think, when you hear evolution, what do you think about? Darwin, Darwin, right? And what's the catchphrase that we've all heard, supposedly, that Darwin said? Survival of the fittest, that we think that's how it is. Well, do you know that Darwin didn't actually say that? It was someone else that coined that phrase. So I'm gonna share a little bit about that. According to biologists, and this is from these are some more recent studies, I would say like 2006 20, and on, that people have been, probably even before that actually, studying this. Um, but these biologists said cooperation has been more important than competition in humanity's evolutionary success. Compassion, compassion, not competition, but compassion is the reason for both the human race's survival and its ability to continue as a species. Not just continue, but to thrive as a species. Charles Darwin did not coin the phrase survival of the fittest. That was invented by Herbert Spencer, but he instead actually argued against it. Darwin was very clear about the weakness of the survival of the fittest argument and the strength of its sympathy hypothesis when he said, communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. Right? So kindness, compassion, right, means that we are more likely to pass along our genes. You see, there are kids in all of this. All of this. Let's see if there's anything else he says. He calls compassion the almost ever-present instinct, especially when humans witness the suffering of another. So we are called to be compassionate. We are called to be courageous sometimes in sharing that compassion and that love. Because it doesn't always seem like the thing to do when the world is telling you that it should be otherwise, when the world is telling you you should be afraid when the world is telling you that it is the strongest that survive. 
so many nights for that. You know, one of the things I read this week said, <laughs> less preparation and more presence. And I tried to embody that, but didn't do very well. Because <laughs> there was just so much, so much I wanted to share with you. Those of us who wish to see a truly, radically different world must demand of ourselves the possibility that we are called to lead, not from the right or the left, or from majority or minority, but from spirit to liberation, from spirit to love. Back to the survival of the fittest. Humans so far have generally deified and aligned with the king of the jungle or the forest, right? The lions, the tigers, the bears, and yet so many of these creatures, for all their isolated ferocity and their alpha power, are going extinct. While a major cause of that extinction is our human impact, there is something to be said for adaptation, the adaptation of a small collaborative species. So many other more collaborative life forms continue to proliferate, to survive, to grow, and to sustain. And we can learn from all of those. Care and compassion. You know, I think about too, I'm just kind of floating all over the place. Hope you all don't mind. Stream of consciousness almost. <laughs> but as my aunt is laying there in her bed and my parents are there again today, again in Miami visiting, she keeps telling my dad, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anybody else. Just worry about yourself. And at the same time, she's worried about her husband. She's worried about her son. She's thinking about all these other people. And she is totally at peace about herself. And any of her concern or care is really about the other people in her life. Yeah. Isn't that the truth, right? And that's how it is for all of us, because that is our nature. Right? We, we are here to love and to, and to be loved. And so if you want to thrive, that's where it's at. Oh, here we go again. Many of us have been socialized to understand that constant growth, violent competition, and critical mass are the ways to create change. But emergence shows us instead that adaptation and evolution depend more upon critical, deep, and authentic connections. Those are the threads that we can tug on for support and resilience. Yeah, but between uh, revolution and evolution. Evolution and revolution. Why is trying to do it really fast overnight? Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak about what Karen just said. It's the difference between revolution and evolution. Revolution makes it hard and fast and, and sometimes violent, though not always, right? versus evolution, which is more in its natural state. Not to say that it isn't, always, it isn't a little messy sometimes or uncomfortable. Right? Is anyone feeling themselves evolving as human beings right now? Things changing and shifting, right? I, I am right there with you. And it's, it's not comfortable always. It doesn't always feel good. It's worth it. It's, it can be scary and painful, but it is absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. The quality of that connection between the nodes in the pattern is love, is love. Now, you know there are spaces between everything, right? There are spaces between us. There are spaces between the words on a page. There are spaces between the words I'm speaking right now. Spaces between all of it. If there was no space, what would there be? Right? There wouldn't be anything. It would all be the. It would all be collapsed on itself. The whole world. Right? What if God? What if love is what is in the spaces between? Right? The physical spaces, the metaphorical spaces, the spaces between thought, the spaces between words. What if it's all held together? by this thing we call God, or love. Isn't that an interesting thought? Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. 
right? Because when we break it down even more, right, you break down the substance into the molecules and you break the molecules down into the atoms and the neutrinos and the electrons and you try to break all these things down, what do you find? Nothing. Nothing. Space. Space. What if that's what it is? Think about it, right? That it is all God, that it is all love, that that is the truth of everything. Cool stuff.